Can you tell me a bit about what your experience was? On the day we left Liverpool about quarter to 11, got to Sheffield, quarter to one, walked down about 15 minutes from the coach, um, got to the ground, we were due to meet somebody outside, our friends of ours outside, um, but we were approached by a mounted police officer who was really rude to us about by the state, he basically swore at us. Uh, he told us to either get in the ground or piss off. Um, he just, that was their attitude anyway. On the, you could just see the way they were with us on the day. So we decided we'd go inside. When we got inside, we'd not been there before, but once we were inside, we were on a concourse, so we decided to wait there um, and wait for our friends to come through. But we never came through the turnstiles and it was about quarter past two, so we decided to go down the tunnel, which is the only place that we could see to go down. We'd stood there for half an hour, didn't see anywhere else that we could go. So we went down the tunnel, went to the right, and three. <coughs> Um, quite crowded at the back, so we pushed our way through, but as we got through, it came a bit more empty towards the front, so we got in front of the front turnstile on the right-hand side, um, which turned out to be the little bit that was left of the barrier that collapsed. Um, and the build-up just got gradually um, more busy. And then I don't even remember the teams coming on the pitch. I don't remember anything about the football being played because at that time I was fighting for my life. Um, I could hear my friend who was just, ended up just behind me. She was shouting that she was dying and I needed to help her. Couldn't do anything to help her. I was trying to breathe myself. Every time I took a breath, it was stopping at my throat because it just couldn't expand my lungs at all. I just, I don't know if I passed out, but I remember I gave up. I knew I was dying. You knew, you just knew that you are gonna die. Uh, I gave up. Um, and the next thing I knew, and whether I did pass out or not, I don't know. Next thing I knew, there was a pile of bodies next to me. My friend just um, said, come to this way quickly. And two men got us over the side, pen into pen two. Um, we were in pen two for a while. Well, probably not a while, it's about five minutes, because they were taking people past us who were really seriously injured. Um, and then we got onto the pitch and we just had no energy to do anything. Once we were on the pitch, um, we just sat on the, on the floor, didn't know where my brother was for a while. Then we saw him climbing out himself from pen, two, pen three to pen two. And we met our friends on the pitch. Um, it was surreal what was going on around us. So it was like I wasn't there um, and it was just a dream. And I remember thinking I need to go and help because I was actually, I'm actually a nurse, I was a student nurse at the time, but my body just didn't do anything and the guilt of not helping is just unreal. That's been hard to live with. Yeah. It changed your life, though. It changed my life totally, yeah. Um, I did carry on. I was a nurse, I've been a nurse for 30 years now, so... Um, but there's parts of nursing that's been hard because of it. If people have been having problems with breathing, that just takes me straight back. Um, but yeah, it did change my life. Are you getting strength from sharing the experience with others who were there? Yeah, it's, I haven't even spoken in the group about my experience. It's not something that I do talk about. No, it's the first time we've heard your experience, to be fair. We've got to say you did very well there. Yeah. And you've got not to feel, and you've got not to feel guilty yeah. about. I can tell you that. <clears throat> but that's that, that's the thing about the group, though, isn't it? Is we've got people coming, and they're doing what Diane's just done there. They're speaking about it for the first time, um, and after thirty years, that's you know, the strength that must take, even yeah. amongst people who know what they went through. The fact that we are a group now certainly offers me a lot of support to know that I've got that solidarity. What was your direct experience? We went from a beautiful spring morning into uh, carnage and I found myself uh, in a position where I was used to packed crowds and it was very, uh, it was, uh, very acutely aware that this was a very different situation. I don't know what time before kickoff. Um, I know I got in at quarter past two because I'd seen the clock on the, in, in the stadium. Um, I don't remember the teams coming out. I didn't watch any of the game. I didn't know about any of the incidents. People talk about Peter Beasley getting the crossbar and all this. So I didn't see any of that. Um, people were very anxious and then very distressed very quickly after that. 
um, the crush was, to me, my experience, the best way I've heard it described, it was like a vice. I didn't feel a surge. I felt it was like slowly and surely it was just getting worse and worse. Um, in our, there was people on the crash barrier behind me screaming for help, and I do mean screaming. Uh, I remember shouting to a police a police In all that noise, I could shout to a fence at the front of us uh, for, and make eye contact with a police officer, and I remember shouting to him, open the gates. And he just looked at me and he mouthed at me and pointed behind me and said, get back. I remember those two words in slow motion almost. At that point, I, I realised, I thought, these people in those uniforms either don't want to help us or can't help us. They're not going to. They're not going to help me escape. I knew I was in a life-threatening situation. I didn't think I was going to die. I, just, I can't um, really believe, looking back, and it's not a, um, anything other than an observation. Um, I just stayed very calm and focused on getting through it, and I don't know if I was presented with the same set of circumstances again, whether that would be the case, but on that day, that's how I was. I was with a friend of mine, and um, um, we noticed that some of the lads were escaping by crawling over heads over the crowd. So while we were pressed up against each other very tightly, they were crawling over heads to the front. So um, me and my mate decided to make, make a, an effort to do that. He was able to wriggle very, very slowly upwards. I was able to, I was fortunate, I had my arms weren't locked down by my side. I had my hands up. So as I, um, I was able to help me mate. He somehow wriggled himself a little bit up and I was able to help leave him onto the top of the crowd. And I thought, right, me next. Um, and as I slowly but surely levered myself up, some fellow who was standing next to me now I wouldn't, not, wouldn't recognise him. And he just said, hey, ah, mate. And he, he helped me forth and I got onto the top of the crowd and I crawled to the front. And um, it was a very surreal experience and it came up very fast, the gate to us. So um, I grabbed the, the frame at the top of the gate, ready to haul myself through. And a police officer confronted me at the gate and um, grabbed me here while I was on, in my vulnerable position at the top of the crowd and he pushed me back in. Uh, and he shouted at me, and I'll quote, you f And he went to push me back in, and I just thought, no chance. I'm not arguing with the police, but I'm not going back in there. Uh, I was able then to help force myself through the gate, and he helped throw me down onto the track on the side of the pitch. So I went over and I seen a, a, a lady who was distressed. Again, I wouldn't, couldn't tell you who she was. She was crying in the netting behind the goal, and I went over and sort of rubbed her head and said, you're all right. And, you know, tried to be light-hearted almost. Um, I was looking for my mates, I couldn't find them. I had noticed, you know, there were people all in the penalty area, people, you know, getting resuscitated. And uh, I asked, um, I noticed that people were getting carried on the makeshift uh, hold, you know, the advertising boards, they were getting used as stretches. So I thought, I'll get stuck in here, I'll have some of that. Um, I asked some fella to, he said, let's get this lad up to the other end of the pitch. And he was very calm and he just turned to me and he, I could tell he knew what he was doing. He just went, I'll get him breathing first. He just put his hand up like that. So I thought, OK, he knows what he's doing. So I went over to the side of the pitch and grabbed an advertising board and um, it was very wobbly, more wobbly than I'd anticipated. And I've got, a, I've got a very small cut on my finger, which I thought was the only injury that I'd got, a physical injury that I'd got from Hillsborough. But uh, my mum had noticed the day after that when I took my shirt off, I had a... Um, a bruise in the shape of a hand on my back. And that wasn't from being struck, that was just the nature of depression in the pens. Um, I was looking for someone to help and I went over and I seen a young lad on the pitch and he was um, he was unconscious. His eyes were closed and his mouth was open. I've never been able to find out who he was. I've tried. Um, so I, I was stood with a young lad, I was 20 at the time, and I was with a lad who was definitely younger than me, and a policeman was with us and he had his helmet off. I remember that sticking in my head. And I thought he'd take the lead at that point and he didn't. Um, again, that's an observation, I'll, I'll tell you the truth, because I did expect him to take the lead, but he did help us, this individual officer. Um, but anyway, I pulled the advertising board, pulled the, the young lad onto the advertising board and we ran up to the other end of the pitch and we laid him down in the opposite penalty area. Assuming then that the, a fleet, the fleet of ambulances and medics was gonna come like the cavalry, you know, and, 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 and save everybody. Um, I went back down to the other end of the pitch. Um, during this time, I, I distinctly remember that line of police officers hand in hand. I thought they were a waste of time. I thought they could have been getting stuck in. I went over to an officer who um, had a cap on, not a police helmet, so he was obviously an officer. 
And I said, is there anything you'd like me to do? I just, and he just looked at me and said, no, it's okay, we're looking after everything now, thanks. And um, he was the first police officer that day who'd been courteous to me. The last couple I'd had any dealings with. Um, I've got to say, um, they were downright rude to me. They were obstructive. I'll never, ever be able to uh, believe that he couldn't see the distress that we were in. So quite what they were trying to do, I don't know. Um, at this point, I thought, my mum's going to be out of her mind. I better phone her. So I left a pitch through the players' tunnel and found a phone in the ground and phoned home and told my mum I was safe and um, asked her to phone me. Uh, he makes mum as well and say, I'm not with him now, but I can swear to you, I've seen him escape and whatever you hear from now, we're coming home. Uh, that was my experiences on the pitch. I got to the ground about half two, or just before, or we got into the ground about half two. Um, obviously, I was in the, the crush outside, um, and it was sort of starting to get really out of hand by then, from what I can remember, because people had started, just started to climb over the turnstiles as we were going through the turnstiles. Um, so, obviously, I handed my ticket in and had to stop taking off me. We went straight down the tunnel. Now, I'd been there earlier that year for the league game against Sheffield Wednesday, and, and I'd arranged to meet a friend who was travelling up from Melton Keynes. So, the plan was to meet him at the back of Pen 3 where we stood uh, for the league game. So I went straight down the tunnel um, and literally just round the edge of the wall and took a position behind that wall with my back to the uh, like the wall of the uh, West Stand. Because um, <clears throat> that sort of little alcove, you know, in games, next to alcoves like that or a stanchion, it was usually like a little safe place in a pocket of air where you, you, if the crowd was swaying, you wouldn't get drawn into that crowd, so it was always safe. It must have been about quarter to three, maybe a little bit later, I can't remember times. But there was an, a surge, which seemed to come from the direction of the tunnel of people. And as that surge went forward, I sort of got dragged out of that space um, and taken with that surge, along with a couple of my friends who were with me. There was, five of us all together, so I think it was about three of us that got drawn out. I think kick-off had happened and then there was another surge um, and I got taken out of that space again and this time I couldn't get back and I just I got taken down to the first crash barrier um, and I was pinned up right against that sort of, I could, f I mean if I'd had a belt on it would have been embedded in, in my gut but I could feel it sort of like the crash barrier pushing just underneath me got um, and there was the sway and everything and it was just sort of a brief moment where there was space so I was able to push back and get one of my feet on that barrier to try and push back which is something you you would do if it was busy on a you know on the best of occasions just to sort of steady yourself um, and then there was another sort of push and I got pushed forward but rather than going into the barrier, I, I got lifted up um, and managed to be stood on that barrier uh, for a brief second and then virtually straight away the crowd in front of that barrier sort of there was movement there and I sort of got I lost my balance, fell down with my knee at a right ankle landing on that barrier so I sort of whacked my knee um, and then at that point, I just turned to them and said, we need to get out of here. It's just, this is not, you know, some of them weren't, you know, they didn't sit on the cops, so they weren't used to that. And they hadn't been to away games, so they weren't used to that sort of sway and this, that and the other. So I said, look, you know, this is normal. You know, we need to get out of here now. Um, managed to get up on the crash barrier again <clears throat> and sort of in a combination of one foot on the crash barrier and the other one on people's shoulders, sort of made our way to the side and climbed over the perimeter fence into pen two towards the back of pen three um, and then the others followed and um, once we were in pen two uh, there was a couple of other lads who had already got into pen two but had stayed stood on the perimeter fence a bit further down towards the front and were trying to pull people up out of pen three I could see just like a sea of feet hand you know arms and legs and it was obvious that people were in distress and people were on the floor um, and then we after that we were screaming 
uh, a police officer to open the gate of Pen 2 so we could get on the pitch. I um, just remember vividly one lad saying, my brother's in there, he's dying, let me out, let me out. Um, I remember hearing a guy come down saying, a doctor, let me out. And they were refusing to let us out initially. Um, and then eventually this guy who claimed to be a doctor convinced this officer to open the gate. And when he opened the gate, <clears throat> we didn't give him a chance to shut it again. And we just wanted this, this lad who was after his brother grab that gate. And all of us got out. Um, and we went down to the side of the main stand and started ripping advertising boards up because we'd noticed you know, people had already started doing that. So we joined in help with that. I can remember firemen and St John's guy come running down the steps from the main stand and they were carrying an oxygen bottle or two and we basically formed like a bit of a human chain so they could pass it over the advertising board and, and they'd climb over and then we'd hand it back to them and they went so and I can I remember as they were running towards the, the Leppins Lane and I can remember hearing one of them say that the bottle was empty. Um, and then we had jugs of water being passed over to us, people from the main stand, like just fans were going up and getting jugs of water and they were getting passed over, so we were passing them around. <clears throat> and then I just remember turning around and just looking at the carnage in front of me and seeing people lying on the pitch, people having CPR. Um, and I just remember one figure, this guy quite short in stature but large build. And it didn't register to me who he was or, or there was no but it just I just realised that yeah, the people are dying here. People, you know, this guy looked dead. Um, I hadn't met this friend I was meant to meet. And so I stood my, he was a couple of years younger than me. I was 19 at the time. And I just went into a blind panic, thinking I've got to find him, I've got to find him. So I, just, I was just walking around in shock. I tried to get through the cordon when the police had formed the cordon. I asked them, I said, look, I need to, I'm trying to find my, told to get back in no uncertain terms. Um, and I just remember that cordon moving further and further towards obviously the Liverpool end, eventually getting to the halfway line. Um, and I just spent the rest of the, my time in the stadium just looking for my mate without um, any success. And I was just in total shock. And we went back out the tunnel, and obviously, we could see the carnage, the, the crash barrier that had gone. Uh, there was obviously hats, scarves, odd trainers, fag packets, everything. Just it was just like you know, like a war zone. But while we were waiting for people to return, they had the radio on, and it was going. You know, the death toll was. I specifically remember it going from 17 was one number I heard, and then by the time we left, it was 54. Um, and then the next thing I remember is we pulled off the motorway near Huddersfield, and we found a phone box, and it was like a queue. The whole coach was just in a queue. So this phone box, we're all phoning home, all doing the you know reverse charge call because none of us had any change. Anything that was in our pockets that day, we'd, we'd lost it. It was only when I got home uh, about nine o'clock that night that I found out that one of my friends, Christopher Edward, was missing, and we found out the next morning that he was one of the 96. Would you say Hillsborough has changed your lives? Yes, greatly. I mean, I'd experienced trauma before it. And I think that's what saved me on the day because I was more hardwired to that fight or flight, you know, the biological, you know, nature thing that we've all got built into us. So I think I reacted to it a lot quicker. Um, uh, I mean, the trauma I'd experienced as a, you know, as a child was, was totally different to, you know, this. I'd never experienced anything like this before. Um, but I've been run over and I'd had other experiences trauma wise. And in therapy, they said that you know it's you got out quicker because of this natural instinct that you obviously were more hardwired for. Um, but I've struggled with it for many, many years. I've I've had to leave jobs because of it because I was getting bullied. Because it being Ellsbury Port, we had people who worked there from different areas, so there was different, you know, fan bases. Um, so you, you get a lot of taunting and stuff. And a lot of it was probably done in jest in their eyes, but to me it was it was torture. I went through a, a <clears throat> breakup in a relationship, um, which was was the trigger for my like the trauma, real facing the trauma of Hillsborough. I'd have I had the recurring nightmare for 12 years every night, where I'd 
relive the experiences that day and seeing this the guy that I saw on the pitch. Um, and my mind would tell me that it was Chris. No, I never knew it was Chris. Um, but my mind would tell me it was Chris, so I'd feel guilty for the fact that I walked away from that person on the day. <clears throat> and then this nightmare would go on and on, and then I'd be at Chris's funeral. Um, and then basically me and, in this nightmare, me and Chris would change places. And it'd be me in the box, but I could see, I'd be lying in this box coffin, and I could see everyone looking at me, and Chris would be there, sat where I was sat in the pews, now looking at me. It was only when that part of the funeral, when you throw the soil, you know, into the grave, of that soil hitting the top of the ledge, that's when I'd wake up in just cold sweat, screaming. And I'd go through that every night. I'd spend many nights awake, um, I self-medicated with drugs. Uh, I used cannabis to try and help me sleep. Um, and then eventually I went and got help, went to see the GP. And it wasn't for another two years before I got cancer. Um, and even then, the counsellors would, they'd focus on other traumas that I'd experienced. They sort of shied away from the hills with stuff. It wasn't until 1999, 2000, <clears throat> where I, I'd moved to Herefordshire to escape it. I had to move away from Merseyside. You know, I realised years later that you can't run away from yourself. It was me that I was running away from, really. Um, and I got this male counsellor for the first time, and he was an Aston Villa fan, and he used to stand on the Holt end, which was obviously their cop. So he had some understanding of what it was like in those days to stand that terrace. And that really helped. That was like the sort of breakthrough. He encouraged me to go into mental health um, because he said, you know, you've, you've obviously got the skills to do that, um, and which is what I did. And um, I spent 15 years in mental health trying to help other people. And it was, it was a good distraction. Um, but every now and again, I'd have relapses. I had a big one in 2014 where I was <clears throat> formally diagnosed by a psychiatrist that I had PTSD um, and I got specific and specialist therapy for that and I only got that because I worked for that NHS trust I think um, if I hadn't have worked for them I wouldn't have got it and this you know this is the importance of you know this you know the group that we've set up that we can provide through fund you know <clears throat> seeking funding and raising money to help people to get the specific trauma-based therapy that they need, which is not readily available on the NHS. Um, I remember I got sent, uh, referred to an occupational therapist, and I thought, why do I need one of those? You know, my living skills are fine. You know, I can cope with day-to-day -day stuff. But this guy was trained in rewind therapy, and that's what I had. It helps. It's been... A godsend to me. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be sitting here t today if I hadn't have had that. I've had, you know, I've had suicide attempts, um, self harm. I'm tattooed because that was the more positive alternative to cut myself. I'd started cut myself, and then I went and got a tattoo to commemorate the '96. And the feelings I got from that was the same feelings. But that was Hillsborough that did that. Those Hillsborough did that, yeah. Everything's been about hills, but I've lost relationships. I've lost family members because of it. Um, I haven't seen a daughter for 20 years because of it. Um, and it's all because of hills, but other people might say otherwise. But to me, if it hills were hadn't happened, you know, those things wouldn't have happened. Yeah, it's um, blighted me life and uh, it's part of me as much as anything else I've ever experienced. Um, Becoming a dad is the best thing that ever happened to us. And, um, Definitely. Yeah, you know, um, I've been so fortunate, mm. you know. I'm in a fabulous, you know, relationship now with, you know, uh, a lady I love very much and the family that comes from her family and mine. Um, You're in a good place. Mm. Yeah, very much. Yeah, very much. And, and, and given that, uh, I, I don't feel... Not a duty or a responsibility... But I think it's the right thing to do, isn't it? If if you can help others who are not quite along the same journey as far as you've got yet. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, even just by association, even just by being friends, you know what I mean? 
Um, you know, however that is, you know, that, that's a good thing. Um, I'd say um, I, I was diagnosed uh, in the early days of it with post-traumatic stress disorder to a moderately severe extent was the official um, diagnosis. Um, but having, um, being in a, a, a good and a caring community who did understand Hillsborough and being in a, in a good family and then becoming a dad, and it was like the sun, um, the sun shone properly again after my lad was born. I could, there was a difference in the sunshine that I, I find it difficult to explain properly, but that certainly lifted me and that certainly um, gives you renewed strength because you have to, don't you? And I think um, those experiences have certainly put me in a good place. I have my moments, don't get me wrong. Um, there's times where I'll be frustrated by things the same as anybody else. And I'm sure um, I could have achieved different things in life or could have been a better person or a calmer person if it hills where hadn't happened, but it did. And you've just got to sort of like make the best of it because um, how could you be anything other than bitter about it? But then if you are bitter about what happened and it eats away at you, you've already lost a lot. Get on with enjoying the rest of your life. Um, so you've got to balance things, haven't you? Sort of like to try and got to um, establish the truth because of the lies um, and live your life to the full. But yeah, it's had a profound effect on us. And um, I know that, you know, if people describe you uh, or how you'll be remembered in life, they'll say, oh, you know, he was a dad, he was this and he was that. I, I know that, you know, Hills was a survivor will be something that people will say, yeah, that marked his life, didn't it? Quite clearly. It did. It's marked all our lives, hasn't it? It's, a, it's been an open wound for our entire community for far too long. Why now feels like a good moment? Why this has been needed? What's the value you're finding from having got together in an official way? I know you knew each other, some of you, informally before. I think it's support is the main thing. Um, we've got together. Um, and you're with people that understand and obviously empathise with what you went through that day and what you've had to obviously had to live with over the last near 30 years. Um, and for me, it's, it was quite clear that there was a lot of people who survived the pen three and four that still needed support, both you know, on a personal level and obviously on a professional level. Um, so it was important for me that we, you know, we got this group together um, and provided support and friendship for those that survived the disaster, uh, and also obviously to to <clears throat> to talk to the club um, and you know start dialogue with the club to see how they could sort of help survivors and and up to now they've been you know they've been a great support with us and they've allowed us to expand by providing us a space to hold meetings and so each meeting we have every month uh, we have new faces coming along and we have a large social media presence as well um, where many members of the group from around the country uh, can obviously get in touch to have a formation and getting recognition for survivors is something that's vitally important um, on a number of levels. I think all that Ian's saying about you know emotionally supporting people, um, how our views are recognised, you know concerns that we've got about things that will come up in Liverpool's story, issues about Liverpool's next visits to South Yorkshire or. Um, you know the debate around you know the rail seating and, and things like that. Imagine having things like that coming up, and not speaking to the people who were you know at the eye of that, the very storm. I think um, the most important people for me will always be, you know, those who were kill unlawfully killed and the families. But by the same virtue, at the same time, at a parallel time, mm -hmm. this disaster happened to us, and we went through extreme um, circumstances and. Getting together will help people and being recognised, you know, the status of survivors and their needs about how they deal with, you know, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or late onset of me mental issues or whatever it is, um, is very important, very important. Do you feel the same, Diane? Um, yeah, I think it's something that's been needed for a long time. And I think the fact that social media is now about, it's one of the best things that's come out of social media, really. It's been able to get us together um, and allowing people to talk. Um, a lot of people who don't live in Liverpool feel like they've been on their own for a long time and just through the group 
we can bring them into the group and hopefully they can come up to the meetings even if it's one a year and just know that the people around that still feel exactly the same as they do because there's been a lot of people that have felt very alone for a long time. Obviously, the 30 years has been consumed with Campaign for Justice. Yeah. Do you feel that your welfare has been perhaps been put to one side while that's going? Yeah, um, by the authorities, by ourselves, by society. You're going back to what happened to us in 1989. Like I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder to a moderately severe extent. I went through counselling from the early stages and I think I've benefited over time with that. I'm not saying my life's been perfect <laughs> and certainly mm -hmm. I've had my issues and my troubles along the way. And when the subject of Hillsborough comes up in the media, it regurgitates things, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult place for us to integrate into our lives. We'll never get over what happens, but we can, we can learn to live with it. But certainly there, there was a sense of... Um, you know, am I worthy to speak about the subject? You know, you know, I've survived it. You know, I haven't been killed. Um, and then you might say, well, you know, I haven't lost a relative. So it's a question of how worthy you, you felt mm -hmm. about then addressing the issues that you got. So from yourself first, you didn't, you know, a lot of people didn't give it the attention that it, that it was needed. If you look at think attitudes now, um, you know, recent disasters that's, that's happened in this country. I think the way that people who survived, things like that, I looked at far more um, constructively or the welfare of them. It just wasn't of its time in the late 1980s and people have struggled. And then obviously during the legal processes, the focus quite rightfully, 100% first things first is on those who were unlawfully killed. And of course, the first person you'd, you'd feel sympathy to is the the loved ones and the direct relatives of those. But like I said before, this disaster also happened to us and we've experienced uh, severe mental trauma. And over time, it, it just hasn't been picked up. I'm not saying it was malicious, but it was just, it just that, that important issue that I think would be more likely to be picked up in this day and age wasn't picked up then. Mm. You know, we've spent all this time focusing on you know, the fight for justice and supporting the families. Uh, and by doing that, you, you're putting your own needs to one side. And I think over the years, um, I mean, me personally, things have just built up and built up because you've not been dealing with them yourself, because you've been thinking of others and supporting others. Um, <clears throat> that it's, you know, it just, it just gets too much to deal with. Um, and I think now is the, the time it's right, you know, that we're the ones that tell our stories. You know, we've had people tell our stories in the past um, that weren't there or, you know, didn't survive, you know, the, the life-threatening situation. Um, you know, it's about right that, you know, the time's right for us, you know, to tell our stories now and obviously educate people about what we went through, not just on that day, but obviously for the last 30 years. There's, um, a, there's a legacy yeah. about Hillsborough and the way it's <clears throat> taught that's important. Exactly. To, to us, yeah, it's the education. Education, you know, the, educating the young mm. people. Hillsborough's a prime example of social justice, it's probably mm. the biggest example. Um, you know, we need to tell that story now and tell our story now before it's too late.